Hello, this is going to be a brief lecture on aesthetics of African music. And basically, we're going to be looking at some general musical traits that we find in African music, even though there's a lot of diversity and variation, depending on the culture group and the region of Africa, there are some things that we can determine that are might be similar or unique to some African traditions. So that will be the focus for today. There is um, a handout in Canvas for you if you want to follow along for this, and that is called, let's see, what's... That can be found in Module 6 called Lecture Outline Notes. Okay, so let's get started. There are, I'll show you that document. What this is going to have is some of the primary vocabulary I'll go over in this lecture and also some four characteristics to consider when listening or observing African music. So here are some of the key terms that will be important for you to understand today. And aesthetics, of course, is the one we will start with, which generally just can refer to musical traits. And that can either refer to sonic characteristics, the way the music sounds, or the way it's put together. But I would also say that as it's performed, sometimes these aesthetics are important to think about in processes of performance. We'll begin with solo music and then we'll shift to ensembles. Some things we'll look at is texture, which is the layering of musical sound and visual arts texture basically means the tactile characteristics of a piece of artwork, but in music, it will refer to the layers and how that is working. Hocketing is a unique way of working layers where there's some kind of um, interlocking aspects. And then as a result, you hear the, the combination of those interlocking aspects. We'll also look at staggered entrances and how that works, particularly in ensemble music. I mentioned earlier the result. The resultant effect is usually what people will hear or experience put together by multiple parts. However, the resultant effect is really considered to be the ideal. And so these parts have to fit together in a particular way so you do get the right result. And then also ways to create musical interest or variety in African music. It may not be how you would approach that in another type of ensemble. And then how tempo is a unique element of expression in African performance. The, the terms on the right here in purple are the four key characteristics that I would like to focus in on when we look at some examples. So we'll start with solo music. A lot of African music, in, when we look at traditional music, is ensemble based, but some of it is going to be solo music as well. And so there's a couple of examples here I want to show you. One, I'll begin with an instrument called the kora, and there are different variations on this instrument, but this is usually played by a, one person. There isn't a lot of ensemble accompaniment. However, as this person plays, you will see that there are different layers and different parts that one individual can play. These are usually played by the, the griots or the storytellers in Mali, and there's some in Senegal, similar to areas where we see the djembe traditions as well. So let's take a look at some of that video. This is Tumani Giobat. Bate, and he's going to discuss how he puts together a song on a single instrument. Je commence par la basse, vous voyez? Maintenant, l'accompagnement. Je 
j'improvise maintenant. Quand j'ai commencé à jouer à la Cora à l'âge de 5 ans, It's a very complex instrument, and the only way that is possible is to use different parts of your hands, where the thumb might be playing the bass line, and then other fingers will play that accompaniment part. And you notice that there's a lot of repetition. So that's something we will get back to in a minute here. But he creates that initial ostinato and then layers these things on top of it, and then puts it out there as a whole composition. The notion of two or three parts is something to consider. Almost all traditional African music has at least two or three parts for a minimum. So next I'm going to, let me pull up the image. So that was an example from West Africa. Now I'm going to show a solo example from North Africa. This man plays an Egyptian flute called the Nai. But you're going to see that he also has a desire to add other characteristics and other layers onto this. What I want you to pay attention, first of all, is the quality or the way that this particular type of flute sounds. Okay, so with this example, if I would ask you, can you describe the sound of that particular flute, you might answer with some adjectives. Um, it's very unique, and in contrast to flute technique that is often desired in Western European music, it is a, a lot more airy. You can hear a lot of the breath through the instrument. And there's also a lot of sliding up from one note to another, 
um, getting a lot of what we refer to as microtones. So there, those are two characteristics right there that make this kind of um, aesthetic in North African music, that's a desired aspect, is that you would have that more breathy, airy sound, and that's referring to the timbre of the music or the color of the instrument. And then this kind of way of instilling a key signature, and in this case, it would be a, what's referred to as a mode. Often a soloist will establish a mood by choosing a particular mode. It's sort of like a scale, but it is a, an arrangement of notes in which only those notes can be used in the song. He also recorded himself playing an oud, which was the first stringed instrument, and then a guitar and then the, the frame drum, which is the bendir, and then he put all that together into a more of a contemporary composition, but it gives you a chance to hear some of the more um, color of what that flute is intended to sound like. Okay, so now we're going to shift to ensembles, keeping in mind that we're, we're looking at aesthetics. So there are all sorts of ensembles in Africa. Sometimes you have what would be an all flute ensemble. This is an example of the Tente Bain flute in Ghana, and they have these flute choirs. Flutes can be of different sizes, and you might have larger flutes that play bass lines and so forth. So that's just one consideration that you can have just like an ensemble of aerophones, for example. You could have an ensemble of just voices. This is Lady Smith Black Mambazo singing here in South Africa. And these choirs um, have up to seven or eight different lines. They're quite richly rich in terms of their effect and they have multiple layers of singing. This image down here of the court musicians they are also presenting um, two or three stringed instruments that are plucked or strummed, and then you would have the fiddles, which are bowed, and then two different percussion instruments. And then down here is the what's called the Amadinda xylophone, and this is a very interesting tradition as they have different parts playing, different people playing different parts on a single instrument. Okay, so we will look at this in a minute in terms of when we look at Hakatine, how that ensemble works. So first of all, let's look at the whole idea of layering and multi-part music. This is musical trait number one. So African music usually has two or three parts at a minimum, and sometimes many more. Uh, this is an example of an orchestra from North Africa where we have, you can see that this drum on the floor here is called the darbuka. Currently in this picture, he is playing a type of tambourine. So you might have one of these drums, the bendir, the darbuka, or um, a rick, which is a small tambourine. We have this gentleman at the other end of the ensemble playing the nai, which we saw a recording of. And then you might have a uh, sometimes instead of the flute, you might have a clarinet type of instrument called the mizmar, and then an oud, which is the guitar or a lute looking instrument here, and then a lap zither that has strings stretched across this instrument. So uh, also, often you will have a dancer with this tradition, and they will use zills sometimes, these finger cymbals, and then often jingles either on their hips or their feet. So you can see right there, we have five to six layers of music. I'm gonna play a video of this tradition here so you can see it. And what I want you to take note when you watch this performance, I've selected um, a section where the percussion and um, accordion uh, interchange musical passages in a call and response manner. So you can also see how the dancers will reinforce those lines, but we're going to lead up to a call and response section. Here. <laughs>
Okay, so sometimes the, the layers will be played together and sometimes they will be parsed apart to do this kind of conversation or dialogical type of interaction during the music. So we can look at another tradition as an example here in West Africa there are many musical elements in these drum ensembles and one of the things that we can consider is that ensembles can get quite large in this photo you can see four different drums there are also idiophones like bells and rattles that are played and then often singing and or flute music on top of it this is an example from ghana and this is just to show you again this whole idea of layering and multi-part music now sometimes when ensembles play together, they don't enter at the same point or at the same time. And this is the aesthetic aspect called staggered entrances. And what this means is, for example, a bell part might start and a pattern might repeat and repeat, but a drum part may not begin at the beginning of that bell part. It may come in in one of the spaces or in one of the notes later on in that, in that rhythm. And that way it becomes this kind of cyclical thing where you can't really tell sometimes where the beginning and the end is. So there are ways to layer that aren't necessarily synchronized or um, simultaneously. Sometimes they, they layer on top of each other and different. they might have a different entrance. And therefore they aren't going to orient themselves to this kind of imaginary beat one in a measure but they're going to come in in a, according to the main rhythm that's being laid down. Okay. So in this kind of music, you can have up to eight or 10 layers sometimes. So much of West African music, especially, is going to have many layers. And so when we talk about texture and music, we're referring to the thinness or the denseness of the layers. So sometimes people will talk about this music and say well the texture is very dense meaning that there's multiple layers and one thing that is important to know is that it really is how they all fit together and what the people hear once it's all put together and that's referred to as the resultant effect that is of all the parts that are put together at one time if you want to create musical interest or variety sometimes you don't make things soft or loud sometimes you're going to take these layers and be experimental with them like maybe you will remove about three layers and only have two layers going on at one time this is called pairing of parts or um, just creating interesting combinations for example maybe just a rattle and one drum or maybe a drum and the flute part or maybe two voices and a rattle part so this is where you would thin the texture for certain moments and then often when you want to add a contrast to that, you would bring in the full ensemble again, so you have all the layers and you have a full texture. Okay, so that's that's something that's used all the time, and a lot of times this music is performed outside, and so the subtleties of playing soft or loud isn't going to translate as well. Okay, I'm Another expressive technique for making contrast in a musical performance would be manipulating the tempo somehow. Maybe you would start out a piece kind of slow and then you would move it into a different section by increasing the tempo or vice versa. So tempo and layers is one way to create contrast in a performance. The second musical trait I want to talk about is timeline patterns. And this is where you have one instrument that is going to play the main rhythm. And it functions like a conductor of the ensemble. And usually, so these examples are from West Africa and drumming orchestras. Usually, the, the main instrument to play the timeline pattern would be a bell or a rattle. And these instruments, although they're simple in construction, they're very important to the music because the person who plays it 
has to know what timeline to play and they have to play it very steady and they have to choose the right tempo. So these are very important elements to African music is to create whatever the rest of the musicians are going to ground themselves in. You don't have a conductor waving their hands and marking time like you do in like orchestra music or choral music. You, instead, you're going to have a short pattern that is repeated on one of these types of instruments and then that creates the foundation on which the other musicians can participate. Another trait in African music is this notion of cycles and repetition. So instead of thinking about music like a linear line where it progresses through time and the music or the melody changes and develops, traditional African music deals more with cycles and repetitive elements, ostinatos, things that you can play and then repeat. And then it creates this kind of either a mood or um, again, a foundation for the rest of the music to develop off of. So repetition is important. It is not an indication that the music is primitive or underdeveloped. It is an indication that perhaps the music is meant for movement and dancing. You don't want to change it. And also for communal participation. So if that's the case, if you're making music for those two purposes, if if you're going to perform, you don't want to change the music, the structure of the music. And so often you will hear these short patterns that creates more of a cyclical feel, like a circle, instead of um, a line, if that makes sense. So things that can get added onto that might be a poetic song, um, dance steps that have actual sequences as well, that they have repetitive patterns that repeat. The fourth musical trait is call and response structure. I gave you an example of that. So we know that it can happen in the singing. And this is because music is, when it's performed live, is meant to be interactive with the crowd. So in some singing traditions, there are different ways to do this. This here is, this song is an example of how the leader will start out a song and then the response is everybody sings it back. So for example, I'll sing this short piece here. Sayole, Sayole, Ajima, Sayole, Sayole, Ajima, Sayole, Lay, Lay, and then the whole crowd sings back. Sayole, Sayole, Ajima, Sayole, Sayole, Ajima, Sayole. Lay, lay, and it would go back and forth like that. Sometimes a singer might sing one line and then the crowd sings the rest of the song. Another type of call and response might be where a singer sings a verse like this and then the crowd sings something different, melodically and verbal, but usually it would be simple, something that could be added on to, kind of like a chorus. Occasionally, the, the leader will sing overlapping the response. But often, if the song leader is in charge of the experience, they're going to do this cone response structure. Okay, so cone response can show up not just in voices, but also in instruments. We saw that um, example from the belly dance segment where we had a mizmar and a drum talking back and forth, or it, actually in that recording it was a accordion, but, but it can also be a clarinet or some kind of wind instrument with the drummer, it can even be a violin and a drummer. When it's in, in drum ensembles, usually that's between a high and a low drum or a drum and a flute. Okay. I'm going to show some more videos and talk about them here with some of these traits. So what I'm going to play for you next is, let's see here, a xylophone tradition. Let me show you the pictures of this first. 
So I have a picture here. This is the Amadinda from Uganda. And this is the, a tradition where more than one person is going to play this instrument. And this is going to highlight a term called Hakatin, where one person will play a melody and then another person will play in the spaces of that melody like with a counter melody. And I have two videos to share with this. Music was played for the royal courts originally. Okay, I'm going to play this again, and I want you to take in the different layers and then the resultant, okay? same tradition that is going to add in more gradually so you can pick up how this works. Okay, so that's the end of the lecture on aesthetics in African music. Why don't you go back and review some of those terms and make sure that you understand what they all mean. Thank you.